Hi guys, welcome to our Silicon Brighton Leader Series. Um, I'm going to be conducting a series of interviews with technology leaders and founders from here in the city, uh, brought to you to help you level up and hear from some of the city's most inspiring leaders um, to understand how they've reached where they are in their career and what you can do to try and do the same. Um, so we're going to be talking tech, culture and, and everything in between. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce my, my first guest here, which is Kirk Fletcher from Redico. Now, Kirk has led a number of uh, businesses and held senior positions within technology companies here in the city, as well as founding and exiting businesses. Um, so we're going to hear a little bit about that, a bit about Kirk's background, um, and a lot about Redico, where he's working today, what he's learned throughout his career, and how, that's, uh, how he's implemented that into his current role. And, what works and, and what doesn't, and, um, and and go from there. So thanks for joining me, Kirk. How are you doing? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, not too bad at all. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, yeah, no, great to be here. And uh, hopefully some of the things I've got to say today will be useful for uh, for the people out there. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard so far, I'm, I'm sure they will. I know our community will be very interested in hearing about some of the special stuff that you guys do. Um, so first and foremost, for those that, uh, that don't know you, could you just tell us a bit about yourself and uh, and uh, you know your your role and, and then a bit about uh, Redico as a brief introduction for for, uh, for a starter? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so for me directly, um, I've always worked in development, um, kind of you know ever since uh, well even before university really. Um, it's kind of always been one of those what do you call them, bedroom coders or bedroom hackers, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then moving on, you know, kind of typical stint at Aston University in Birmingham, um, and then kind of moved into working for some pretty big companies um, straight off the bat. Um, I did a, an internship um, at a company called Extant, which got bought out by Cable & Wireless and eventually became Virgin Media. Uh, okay where I was working um, on the, in the engineering department, working on the very first set-top boxes, cable TV boxes, oh, okay. um, which was interesting. Um, and then kind of moving on from there, you know, held positions at places like Vodafone and NHS, all kind of like work, working up through my career, really. Really started okay. up as, you know, junior roles and then moving into mid-level and senior and then eventually kind of, you know, come... Yeah, you know, 2010 uh, to 2012 kind of period. I got I got more into um, starting my businesses, a small a series of smaller startups. Um, some were kind of successful, some were not. Uh, mm. And I think that that in itself is quite a big key. Um, and we'll probably talk yeah. about that a bit later. Is embrace yeah. the failure that you know that most people yeah. will go through, and um, because it's a learning curve, uh, it's never really a failure. So either way, I started uh, an agency, um, a bigger agency in Brighton in 2012, um, which was Wonder Labs. Um, yep. That predominantly focused on um, digital marketing, SEO, website design, and custom software development. Uh, okay. We went from there. We started building our own in-house tools to help our own marketers. Um, and one of the big things at the time was social media management, social media marketing. Um, so we built tools that would not only help our team uh, manage these social media profiles for celebrities and, and large companies, um, but we also developed engagement tools and things like that. Now, this, you know, this became really the big focus of that company. Um, and eventually uh, we had kind of, you know, several rounds of funding, uh, VC investment, things like that. And they took that product and, and introduced it to new markets. And eventually I left that company uh, along with the other um, directors um, to basically pursue uh, new paths. Um, basically we sold up, uh, VCs held most of it and they kind of took it abroad anyway. 
And okay. Yeah, so so that was great. That was a great learning experience. It's not something when you develop one piece of software and that's the company's focus, it's very hard to stay in tune with that forever. Uh, right. So you've got to understand where your natural end has come into that okay. um, yeah. because it's very easy to get complacent. And you know, as a as a developer and as somebody in tech, um, complacency is never a great thing. <laughs> so you always want to be fresh. Um, so yeah, when I left there, I, uh, I was lucky enough to have a bit of time working on a few smaller projects, uh, helping people out, um, doing a bit of consultancy. But really what I was doing is I wanted to um, almost solidify a position where I could really grow and help a company grow into, into the next phase. Uh, and that's where I found Redico. Now, Redico um, are... Uh, for all intents and purposes, a digital marketing SEO agency based in Kent now. Um, mm. They've got offices in Brighton and in Bristol as well. And one of the things, when I started with them, I was kind of, I got brought in more as a, a senior um, technical SEO consultant uh, sure. to help some of their larger clients kind of work through um, more technical issues um, to do with SEO. At the time, um, they didn't have their own development department and were using, um, you know, kind of really good tools, um, but they always wanted more. Um, they are such a, you know, a cutting edge company. I mean, you know, they've won you know, European search awards uh, this year uh, for the best uh, small agency in Europe. Um, you know, they've got great place to work, fourth place this year, yeah. place yeah. last year. Um, so it's one of the best places to work in the UK. But let's say from from the point of view of the work that they do for clients, they really like to go the extra mile. And one of the things that they realized was holding them back um, was the availability of data. Uh, okay. The data that they were playing with was very similar to the data that most other SEO agencies or most other marketing agencies have got to play with. But they understood the requirement for for deeper insights and deeper data and this is where i drew up on all my skills previously and said okay well let's let's put together a team let's put together a software team that i'll run that i'll look after and that'll grow um, and we will create the tools that are required in order to do this uh, so yeah from that point of view that's uh that brings you up to to where it all started with redico yeah, no, great, fantastic. Thanks for that um, that intro. It's really interesting. In terms of um, when you were considering your next move um, from uh, the company that you you sold and you exited, yeah. and you, what what were the key considerations you were giving to at that point? Because obviously you'd you know had a varied career. You'd got to a, a certain level, um, and Redico, obviously, from what you told me just there briefly, sounds like it's got interesting um, and unique. Uh, sort of qualities in comparison to other companies mm -hmm. but at that stage in your career what were the key considerations for you in, in, in terms of your next move and, and the next challenge i think really for me it was uh, uh, the biggest key consideration was values uh, okay. i'm somebody who's quite value driven um and i like to be yes. surrounded by people and you know teams that that share those values i think you know you can put experience aside you can put um ability aside i think if you don't share the same values within a team and within a company as a whole mm -hmm. it's very hard to get anywhere um so for me like i said um you know my focus was on i wanted a company in the right phase of growth and development which redico was mm -hmm. at the time um, mm -hmm. who were looking to not just follow the status quo but you know lead and yeah. also had the values to back that up. And that that's exactly what I saw in that company. And hence, you know, it might seem a strange move. Um, you know, somebody who's been in, you know, hardcore development all their life, um, being mm. CTO of, you know, several companies over, you know, the, the past almost decade at that point, um, to go into a role which was not directly um, development um, yeah. driven, but more uh, technical consultancy. Um, it might seem a step aside, but it's it's the potential that I saw within the company that it really didn't matter to me what I was entering that company for because 
you know, my goal was to kind of help this company with the skills and experience I've got. And yeah. if they did share the same values, they would see that. And mm -hmm. yeah, and that that's exactly what happened. So so for me, it was it was all about values and, and sharing the same ideals, really. Yeah, interesting to hear. I think that's um, a really key point, actually. You know, throughout a process uh, of trying to attract the best people, companies have, have become a lot better at it, but really communicating those values and actually hiring on those values as opposed to previous experience from a, you know, a, you know, from a technology perspective without you know, considering those values and how important they may be into future you know, innovation, product development, collaboration, all really key considerations that should be given at the outset, I think. So good to hear. Absolutely. And I've got, yeah, I say like on, on that very thing, I've got some really good examples of that, which we can cover uh, in a moment, yeah, actually, um, you know, when it comes to growing the team. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. De definitely. In terms of your, so you're, you know, you've been there for how long, excuse me? Two uh, three years now. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. And having gone into a slightly different role, um, from what you've been used to, um, it sounds like you've made some, you know, real impact and actually been really instrumental in, in the way that the company is now working. Uh, without going into too much detail, how have those, those those three years panned out, and how has it been as you expected? And um, I, I guess because of the values you identified earlier, that's probably been in some way to you being able to influence change as well. Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. So I would say, I think within the first. Um, six months uh, we'd already you know, you know as a company I'd spoken to them about you know what I can do what I can what additions I can bring they already had the requirements there um, so I it was literally for me a case of just walking up to them and say look got this skill set this skill set is going to solve this problem and it was a no-brainer um, cool. yeah, the, the green light was given within the first six months really so so kind okay. of go ahead Great, fine. So, in terms of um, your role there and the uh, the team that you've built, mm -hmm. um, what would you say are the most important aspects of you? As and we'll go on to the culture because I know there's a, a slightly different uh, pyramid or, or, or flat structure um, at, at Redico. But in terms of you as a as a leader, what would you say the most important characteristics or um, attributes there are of a, of, a, of a modern you know technology leader sure. sure okay so i mean if we look at say the role and and the attributes of a you know, what a tech leader is i think yeah. first of all um you say being a people person i would say is probably not the right word but you've got to be able to understand your team to bring out the best in a team itself um to really focus on the strengths of each individual person. Now, a lot of companies, that, that might sound really obvious, but in a lot of companies, a lot of places I've worked, especially within development teams or, or technical teams as a whole, what you tend to find is that anybody of you know management or, or team lead or any of those kind of positions, they tend to focus on the weaknesses of the team and try to upskill them as much as possible. Um, yeah. Oh, you've got a weakness here. We need to work on that. We need to work on that. What you find with that is people have become demotivated. It's, you know, yeah. it's a weakness for a reason. It's a weakness because they don't, they have no interest in learning that or they have um, no natural aptitude for, for that area, but they will have natural aptitude and, and more interest in other areas. And it's as a leader, um, You've got to really focus on that. You've got to focus on the strength. What makes them buzz? What gets them excited about the things they're working on? So it's that understanding of the team and understanding yeah. of the individual people within the team as well. Um, yeah. That really helps. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. yeah, I'd say it's like, you know, other aspects of it will be like, you know, driving big ideas, you know, really kind of, helping the team focus on what's in the next six, 12 months from now. Where, where do we, you know, whatever we're working on, where does this look in a year's time or two years time? Where could we aim for? What's the long-term picture of what we're going yeah. for? And getting that buy-in. Um, yeah. And again, you know, th this is something I'll, I'll, I'll go on to later, but 
I think one of the key things is understanding that you as a leader don't have all the answers. Uh, yeah. For those who sit there and you know say, you know, I lead the team, it's my ideas, and those are, I mean, in my in my book, very old school ways of thinking and, and don't work anymore. Yeah. You've got to understand that you are a person who can incite or, or inspire um, you know, ideas, but those ideas are probably going to be a collection of ideas from a wider set of people, not from you. Um, yeah. You may have a rough agenda of where you want to go, but ultimately it's the team, it's the people on the ground doing the work that are going to come out with the best ideas. So Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes complete sense. You know, you're, I guess, creating the environment that's allowing the people that you brought in to be the best version of themselves, whether that's most creative, most productive, and you can pull those together to hopefully create some beautiful things. Um, 100%. You know, I, I mean, it's the same, I guess, in my line of work and there's lots of things that have moved on in the world um since i started doing what, what i'm doing and i guess you're looking at hiring people that fill the skills gaps that i have um to help you know form a, a well-rounded team and it's probably the same i guess in in, in the world of well in most of my work but you know, it sounds like it from what you're saying as well absolutely 100 percent, 100 percent. and on that on, on that note um it, when you're looking to um recruit or add people to to your team and whilst i appreciate every role is going to be slightly different are there um you know sort of non-negotiables or key characteristics that you're always looking for um where you can say yeah they're going to be a really valued member of our, of our tech team or, or our business yeah a hundred percent i mean you know from, from my point of view um yeah I've made a lot of mistakes in hiring in the past. I've learned from them. Um, and I feel it's put me in a really good position um, now with, with recruitment. Um, I'll give you some examples, um, which yeah. will help explain the situation better. I used to be one of these people who would go through the CVs and I would p pick out all the, you know, the, the outstanding attributes like, you know, this guy's got... 10 years in, in C++ development. This guy's got, you know, whatever, you know, X amount of time working for X, Y, Z. You know, really, the, the things that really stand out on a CV, I used to hire based on that. Yeah. And what I found, what <clears throat> this is normally referred to um, in older style companies as, you know, like going for the A players or, or, or the A team, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I've hired, you know, developers directly from Google, from Facebook and, and places like that. Um, and what I've found is that those kind of people, they're very, I mean, I can't say for all, obviously, it's, it's you know, it's very stereotypical. But in my experience, what I found is that they will come with a lot of opinions and a lot of, um, a lot of very strict ways of working. Um, yep. And when you've got 10 or 20 developers, all of that caliber, you tend to find it's very hard to balance. You know, you've got a lot of strong uh, opinions, a lot of strong emotions, a lot of different ways of doing things, and culture is pretty much out of the window at that point. It's yeah. so hard to get a team like that to meld. And what I started doing a little while ago um, was actually putting those things aside and hiring based on you know, eagerness or willingness or, you know, have a real um, passion for, for what it is they want to do, even if their experience seems to be really low. And, you know, I, I'm not going to name names, but there is one particular person in my team who's an, a shining example of that. He was a restaurant manager. Okay. Um, and um, he, you know, had a passion for development. He hadn't ever done it in a, a professional environment. Again, somebody who liked to tinker and build things at home, but in his day-to-day -day yeah. job, he was a restaurant manager. And okay. up against him, um, when I was interviewing for that particular role, I'd had, again, I had people from Google. I had, you know, developers that had been around for, you know, in development 20, even 30 years, some of them. Um, and I thought, no, I'm going to go with this direction because... I don't want the big egos anymore. I want somebody who's hungry, who's willing, who's excited uh, mm -hmm. by this. Um, this guy now on my team, two years in, he is 
possibly one of the best developers um, that I that I've ever met, and that's purely down to his you know his willingness and his drive to learn. He is more valuable to me now than hiring anybody you know a hundred you know 150k a year um wow. from, from another place absolutely amazing so that's a big lesson and that's how i now approach all recruitment it's amazing to hear and i think that um it's something that i guess if you can if you've got time on your side to an extent and you can see that you know, six to twelve months that this is what somebody's going to hopefully you know turn into and become then mm. you know hiring on character is, is always i would say you know, preferable because there's so many benefits that go along with it plus there's you know very few cons particularly if someone's got that curiosity that openness and that willing to learn Absolutely. you know you, you, you bring a lot more into the team than than you otherwise might from a from a closed book perspective so Absolutely. i understand and I think what's important to kind of, you know, j just put on top of that is obviously for somebody starting a new team, you can't just go out and just get, you know, everybody who looks like really up for it, but I've got no skills. Obviously, you do need some skill set within the team to, to help that person grow for those for those people to, to bounce off. Um, but like I say, when, when you are growing a team, you do need to balance it. Like I say, don't just go for the A players all the time. You know, get one or two in. You know, get a couple in that that can that can support the rest of the team that are willing to support the rest of the team. That's that's a key point. Those that are willing to help others grow that can take them under their wing, and then you can flesh out the team with pure willingness and drive and and eagerness, yeah. and that that then you know affects everybody, and it's it's brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, once I just you've got that balance in the in a, a harmonious team. That's when you know they're at their most productive productive and when they're the most effective as well um great so in terms of once you've got that team in place i guess and you've got the balance of you know experience and um sort of not necessarily youth but hungerness and willing to learn what's the most important considerations that you'd give to kind of i guess sustaining that culture you know, once you've created something that's working and it's, and it's going really well, yep. you want to keep doing it, right? How, how do you, or what advice would you give to um, a team out there or a business or company to kind of sustain that, that culture? Yeah, so, I mean, okay, so so based on that, I think one thing that you have to, that you have to really think about is a lot of the traditional models um, of, say, workflow um, don't work for everybody. Right. And I think as soon as you can put these, you know, models aside and start being able to create models that work specifically for your team, it's yeah. much better. So, again, don't be the person that's sitting there who's just read a book and going, right, this is a great model. Let's follow it to the T. And you've got maybe a couple of people that are on board, a couple of people. Are, I hate this. This is rubbish. Don't ever do that. By all means, read these models, pick out the best parts, you know, sit down with your team and say, hey, together, let's what what's the best way for all of us to work together? How can yep. we how can we move by, you know, day by day? How can we produce something? What's the best way for us to work? And what what works now probably won't work in six months time or 12 months time as the team grow or as projects change. Be willing to adapt as well. Don't just follow things to the team. I think in the last year, we've changed our kind of, I don't know, our deployment, code review models, you know, things like that, you know, quite a lot. But we've okay. done it in a way that somebody has started or changed projects or, you know, we're working on something. It's like, you know, this doesn't actually, this this flow doesn't kind of work for me right now. And yeah. bringing that to the team and all sitting down and discussing it as a team and saying, right, what's the best way for, for us to get from A to B to C? Um, yeah. And then building a model around that. But again, do it with the input of the team because then you've got more buy-in. Yeah, it makes complete sense. So, you know, an inclusive process where everyone's involved and you can, you know, almost, um, I think it goes back to, you know, what you said before, playing to people's strengths, but getting everyone involved so everyone's voice is heard and then moving forward, You've got something that's that's working for everyone, right? Absolutely, one hundred percent. 
one hundred percent. It's it, again, it, it does come back right to what I said at the beginning. It's like you don't have all the answers, um, yeah. and you know, don't try and be the person that does have all the answers because you know, ten brains are much better than one. So yeah, absolutely, no doubt. Um, now, whilst we're on the subject of of culture, obviously, you know, twenty twenty has been a year. I think where we've seen everybody move to remote working or increasing levels of flexibility, yeah. which I'm sure um, some, if not most of which is, is here to stay. And yes, there were companies um, offering sort of flexible working and powering remotely before, but certainly um, not to the extent that we've seen this year. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, you guys at, at Redico have been doing something a little bit different for, for some time now. And, and, you know, I've read, articles on um, how you guys have implemented certain culture changes on you know, through some of the national daily newspapers um, and I think whilst the technology industry as a whole has probably been an early adopter of most of those changes sure. still um, certainly none of the businesses that I speak to uh, perhaps doing it on a, on a level to, to which you guys are um, tell me a bit about that culture um, and you know we can then sort of delve a bit deeper into how those cultural changes in the environment in which you've created has lended itself to um, you know, other benefits from a sort of productivity and, and, and uh, innovative technical innovation uh, side of things. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to have to probably try and cut a very long story short. Yeah, no, <laughs> However, no um, when we started off on this journey, um, pretty much around the time I started Redico uh, about three years ago, uh, we were having the ideas of, you know, we didn't want to run like a, a, a traditional company. It doesn't fit in with a, with a, a, a modern feel or a modern office. Um, we didn't, again, we didn't want to just read something out of a book and follow that. We wanted to do, create a culture that was based on everybody's input. Um, first and foremost, we came up with a, a set of ideas, um, which we put to the team, uh, which we later kind of, publicized and yeah kind of pushed out to you know to, to the wider media and things like that the when we first published what we said we was going to do the abuse <laughs> that we got was incredible um we were told we would be dead in six months um the company would be gone that there, there was you know there'd be nothing left um you can't run a company like this torrents torrents of uh, comments coming in so some of the things that we said we were going to do then is allow more freedom to the staff uh, in the sense that we're not going to have direct management. We're not going to have a typical management structure. Um, you know, we allowed, we, we removed holidays. Um, so, you know, normal companies, what, 20, 25, 30 holiday, you know, holiday days per year. We removed it completely. We said, look, the trust is in you as an individual, you're an adult, um, take time off when you need time off. If you're going on holiday, go on holiday. Um, you know, as long as you work with your immediate team and work can be done, you can have as much time off as you want. We're officially, we officially have 365 days a year holiday to take. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and again, it was that trust. The second, yeah part of that original manifesto was to um, allow freedom uh, within hours. So you know, not everybody works from nine to five or works their best from nine to five. I've yeah. got some of my developers um, don't like getting up before 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and they're most productive after seven o'clock in the evening. Uh, why not, you know, cash in on that and say to them, look, if you're not productive in the day, go and do what you want to do in the day. You know, mm -hmm. work, work whenever you want. Everybody's got a, a set of, let's say, responsibilities yep. um, within the company. Everybody. Um, and whether that's, you know, for their own work, for helping other people, um, getting stuff done. It's, you know, those responsibilities are theirs. And if those are those responsibilities are met, it doesn't matter and shouldn't matter to a company how all those responsibilities get met. Uh, yeah, you know, if somebody wants to work throughout, you know, if they're night owls and they want to work through the night and sleep in the day, fine. Uh, yeah. You know, as long as they can they can communicate with their team and you know produce produce the results, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And how is so? Um, 
how are you kind of measuring those those results? Would it be on you know, you've got you're working on certain projects, for example, yep. and we need you know X delivered by by Y, yep. um, and that's pretty much it. You know, as long as you can get this done by by then to the you know, yep. you know the standard that we expect, then that's that's all we want. We don't we're not going to micromanage you. We're not going to check on it on a daily basis. Nope. Um, how does that sort of process work from your perspective? So, so that that's quite interesting as well. So, again, without a management structure, a structure as such, you would think that's quite hard to you know to, to keep track yeah. of. So, everybody is accountable for their own work and accountable for the team as a whole. So, imagine like departments within a company. You know, like for me, for example, um, you know, we've got I've got a development department which has got yeah. X amount of stuff. There's other departments. So there's content. There's you know, uh, project management, there's SEO, obviously. And as a team, you're all accountable for each other. Um, yeah. So your managers are the people you sit with all day. You know, they're, they're your team. That They are your managers and you are their managers. So um, if one person, for example, and, you know, you know, touch wood, it's never happened. But if one person started you know not to produce the work that they were given or, or not to you know hit the results or achieve what they were meant to achieve it wouldn't be a traditional manager sitting down saying hey what's going on it'd be the team the team would get together and say do you need help what's wrong let's you know let's support you from you know through this um and that that is that is the way we work we're all accountable for each other and it works really really well because we managed to stop anything before it come, becomes an issue I was going to say that's the key word. I think the the accountability, and um, I think it probably promotes a sense of togetherness and collaboration within those teams, and you know, not wanting to let anyone in that team down. And you've probably got a, you know, a, that's it. I guess a heightened sense of purpose in terms of delivering things together. And I think that's great. How how has that, or has it affected the the quality of the output and the um, you know the, the the quality of the work. Have you seen a, a shift and improvement, or how has that sort of manifested itself? I mean, yeah. That, so, kind of going back to those comments that we had when we first launched this, um, yeah. which we do now find funny. We did actually consider printing them up and sticking them around the office. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we did an update. I think it was six months or twelve months later. Um, right. We have to excuse. I can't remember the exact facts and figures. Yeah. But we, since introducing this, our um, our profit as a company shot up um, right. by huge amounts. Um, we grew apps. We grew rapidly after that point. The quality of the work being produced was, you know, was an absolute quantum leap from where it was before. Uh, right. We found that by giving the freedom within the team to not only produce the results in the way, in whatever way they want to produce those results, but the freedom in the ways they work as well, definitely led to huge increases in, in quality standards. Um, I, I, I'll give you a really good example. I'm going back to one of my other team members um, who, like I said, he's, he's a bit more of a, a night owl. He prefers working in the evening um, or mid afternoon and kind of takes breaks you know, more in the morning. When he was forced to work, or say forced to work, but when he was in a strict um, time of you know, nine to five or, or eight to four or whatever, um, his quality of work was great. But since moving to a time where he feels he's more productive, his mm -hmm. his quality of work, it, it's, it's, it's on a different league. It's on a different level. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because he's utilizing, you know, he's utilizing those skills when he's best suited to use them. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, like, when you're you're in the right frame of mind and you're in the environment that's conducive to you being most productive, that's the right time to to do what you do, right? Not when you're kind of yeah, as you say, playing to everyone's strengths. I think is the key here. And if you can afford to, it's not like a football team where we've got to be ready at three o'clock to play ninety minutes. If we've got twenty four hours a day and a month to deliver a project, yeah. if everyone's working. You know, disparately, but towards the same common goal, and you know they're working better at different times. Then let's take advantage of the 
the person we've got here and, 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 and play to their strength, as you say. So, yeah, I mean, I think what you mentioned in terms of profit going up, that's going to be something that people are going to, you know, hear and it's going to resonate with them. Um, and, you know, if you're thinking about, I guess, sort of what we can do in terms of creating a, a, a different type of environment or culture, then this is definitely testament to, you know, being, I guess, um, slightly... You know, not just slightly progressive, but you know, doing things drastically differently, and it being a an example of of, of it working. Absolutely, I, I, yeah. I mean, we are we are the really the living proof that you know such radical changes don't have to be scary. Um, I think you know again, you know, one of the things that uh, people were saying when we said we, we'll allow people to take holidays as you know as much as they want and whenever they want. Um, people, you know, kind of laughing, saying, you know, we, you know we're not going to see any of the staff anymore. Um, yeah. What we actually found, uh, unfortunately, uh, was that people were taking less holidays. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, people were taking less holidays. So, again, it's we don't just want to leave it there because you don't want to be um, a company that, that kind of feeds off that. Uh, yeah. You know, we want to encourage people to still take holidays. So, um, in some cases, we are now actually forcing people saying, look, you haven't had a holiday in you know, six months. Just go and take a week off. Just I don't want to hear from you for a week. And, you know, it yeah. works. It really works. Yeah, great. Yeah, putting it in there. Cool. Um, great. And in terms of, um, I guess, it's probably helped. I, I, I don't know the figures, but I guess in terms of, staff retention and things like that. I know it's a challenge for, for companies in what is a really competitive marketplace, but creating that type of environment and um, giving people the tools to do what they can best, I guess that's, you've seen an improvement in staff retention, have you? Or? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think our overall figures are something like 98% staff retention uh, wow. ever. Um, yeah. yeah, people don't really tend to, to, to leave. <laughs> So. people would, would they know exactly. exactly right um and in terms of just mindful we haven't um gone sort of too deep into terms of um you know redico and, and what you guys do a bit differently but i know from our previous conversations that you know in a um a fairly um i guess saturated marketplace of digital and uh, seo type agencies yep. um you guys are again doing something a little bit different in that market, aren't you? Absolutely. Um, uh, and, and, oh, sorry, go on. Maybe, no, I was just going to say maybe you can tell me a bit more about that. I understand there's kind of some proprietary technology behind what you guys do, and you know, certain niche in the markets that you guys are sort of capitalising on. And Absolutely. definitely, I know some of our community would be interested to hear a bit more about that. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, from that point of view, so. Yeah, a lot of people know a lot of the off-the-shelf tools that are available to marketing agencies, SEO agencies, things like that. Um, you know, you've got your SEM Rush, you've got Ahrefs, you've got all the usual tools, Screaming Frogs, and these, these are quite common tools in that industry. And again, one thing um, at our agency that you know, really stood out was whilst this data is is good, um, we need a lot more data to make a real impact especially with bigger clients in more competitive markets. We need deeper insights. And again, what, one of the things that we that we decided to do, um, and one of the things that, that I kind of helped lead Redico into, was developing our own custom tools. Um, right. And this, you know, we, we kind of, we're lucky in the sense that we got to explore tools. There was no real roadmap for what we needed, just an end goal and how we got there was, um, again, down to what I could put together and what my team could put together and hiring the right people with the right mindsets to, to get to that. Um, so what we developed, um, first and foremost, is a tool called Lacuna, which um, some people might start hearing about in 2021. Um, Lacuna itself is almost a suite of tools that work together to produce data. Um, so... Um, layering over artificial intelligence over data collection systems such as usual you know rank tracking data uh, that we pull in ourselves um, and then you know deep crawls of the site and, and pages individually looking at backlinks um, looking at many many aspects pretty much the same kind of you know 
aspects that Google will look at um, when Google bot crawls a site or a page and, and works out how to rank it. Our systems are very, very similar. Um, and we use a lot of artificial intelligence over the top of it all to pull out insights and real kind of meaningful um, insights into things that can't be got from, from other tools, essentially. It's quite hard to, to explain. Um, I think the easiest way I can explain it is probably imagine reverse engineering Google's own algorithm. Uh, right. <laughs> and that changes a lot. Um, that changes, yeah. you know, four or five hundred times a year on smaller, um, smaller yeah. incremental changes. So we developed our own tools to kind of almost emulate that, but also okay. to feed back the insights from that as to what clients are doing wrong or, or where, you know, where things can be improved. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, yeah. So one of, one of the functions of some of the software that we build will look at a web page. It will strip away all the common features such as, you know, header, footer, sidebar, and really just pull out that main content and just look at the wording of that. And then based on where that page is positioned or, or what, you know, target key terms or, or, or search phrases that that page needs to appear for, we will then look at what's ranking in Google already for those things. Okay. And we will do the same to those. We'll strip away all the, you know, all the usual bits from the page and pull out the yeah. content. We then run really deep um, uh, algorithms, like proprietary algorithms over that text to understand, you know, the formality, to understand, you know, kind of, you know, grading and, and reading ease or, you know, how that, how the wording or the terminology, what kind of um, audiences would resonate with the wording that's used okay. um, in those pages. Um, and then we can say, right, for this kind of key term, the, you know, the, what ranks at the top are, is is this kind of content is the content that is you know really geared towards this audience or has this level of technicality or has this level of formality and yeah. you are sitting you know either this side or this side of, of where that target is um and then you know we can suggest you know maybe tone down or tone up the language or, or reduce formality or or this needs to be more technical um, and things like that. So, and that is one very, very small part of a much bigger system. And yeah. all of that, again, that has a lot of AI layered over that, but then there's a, yeah. another layer of AI, which looks at all of these smaller points. And again, that's just a content analysis and there's there's loads of other parts, but then there's this one AI that sits over, over the top of all of that and says, right, here's what's wrong okay. at all, or here, it, well, here is is what kind of Google's algorithm is gearing towards. So we can see the weighting of these. Whilst we might understand the content, that might not weigh as high in Google's algorithm to to whatever that industry is. So right, yeah. yeah. So yeah, sorry if that sounds really complicated, but that's <laughs> no, no. I mean, I'm as you know, no SEO expert, but it's, and it's, you know, some of it will be over my head. But it sounds like you know you're you know you're in an industry that. It solves problems, but you know you're thinking of how can we do things better? What can we do to give, you know, our customers a competitive edge? And um, I guess, you know, having that proprietary technology is is you know is is, is what's needed to get to get them to do that. Um, Absolutely. I mean, we've yeah. got other agents. No, no. So in terms of you know, to create and come up with something like that, obviously. Um, you know, you needed to take a lot of time for, or, or, or did you build a new team to come up with that, that kind of, that kind of product? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the team was developing anyway for probably smaller sets of tools. Uh, yeah, okay. That's what we started off doing. And then I think later on, we decided to actually put all these smaller tools together and see what we could do with that. And that, that's how we naturally where we are now. And did you have any sort of expertise already around um, artificial intelligence? Did you hire new people? Did you, how did you kind of build that expertise? Yeah, so I'd had um, some experience of it before anyway, uh, working in uh, social media tools and things like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, well, I think a lot of it, a lot of the people on the team at the time had no experience with AI. Um, but again, they had the keenness and the drive to say, hey, yeah, I, I would love to do that. I would love to learn that. 
Um, and we did. We just naturally all found ourselves kind of in that, you know, working on it, you know, starting to play with TensorFlow models and things like that. And then before we knew it, we was doing as a matter of course. So it's, again, yeah. you don't necessarily have to have the skills. You have to have the, you know, the, the eagerness, the willingness to, to learn those yeah. things. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, and I think it's probably one of those kind of rabbit holes you can go down where you're, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I guess watching a series of documentaries about something, it's, it's easy to get to get sucked into, but in an interesting way, you know, you're developing your skills and you're staying up to trend with sort of current technologies, but also um, I can imagine it being a little bit never ending in terms of where you can go with this or what you can, what you can do with that kind of product. But you've obviously harnessed that in a way that's um, kind of you know, been able to package up as a product which can help your customers going forward. So that's uh, in a short place of time as well, I think. So that's kind of testament to some of the work you guys have done. Oh, gotcha. Absolutely. I mean, on that, I mean, uh, you know, another point on that is, you know, when we started um, three years ago, I'd say most of uh, most of the developers that, that I work with now or, or kind of came on board, you know, we're used to more traditional kind of web-based languages, let's say. Yeah. Um, so, you know, PHP or or ASP, even in, in some cases, you know, all of those kind of things, which whilst okay, um, not really conducive to building, you know, big data uh, analysis, you know, platforms like we've built now. Uh, yeah. One of the things that, that we went for that, you know, we had a, a little exercise where we started playing around with different languages and what we could achieve and what we could do. Um, and we were kind of benchmarking and creating results, but the whole team got involved in it and it was a real kind of exciting time. Um, and then eventually, um, as a matter of course, we, we settled on Golang. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, Google's Go language. And it was, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it was phenomenal because everybody was excited to learn it. Everybody was, everybody was really buzzing to, to take advantage um yeah you know, of this language and yeah now it's it's kind of yeah it's bread and butter you know da daily code for us now and would you say uh, was that a, a, a period in time where you were all fairly new to, to go like and you're all learning together and couple all of learning years. together yeah even yeah yeah right. so, so yeah we, we we all kind of so we were all encouraging each other um you know we'd have we we have what's called pdd days um anyway so yeah. We, it's probably it, we normally take a, a few days away. Um, we might find uh, a training course to attend when you could attend them, um, or you could you know do do some home learning or just do some just experimentation and build something you know for yourself using a new yeah. language and then come back. And every time this happened, people would be coming back saying, "Oh, I found this package, or I found this way of implementing you know this, that, and the other, or you know, and sharing that with the team, but in a really excited way." And other people would take that on board, and very, very quickly, when you've got a whole team of people excited to learn something, the information that's shared is you know it's, it's incredible. Um, and very quickly, we were able to go from um, very little knowledge about a language to doing some really complex things. So it's, yeah. I guess that's the power of, of working as a team and, and giving them the opportunity to get stuck into something that's challenging but interesting to them that they're going to, again, you know, goes back to the culture, throw themselves into. Um, yeah. And I guess, you're, yeah, as you say, during those PDD days, people are coming back with ideas that perhaps are even surprising yourselves. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely, um, absolutely. It's really good to hear because I think there's, you know, historically companies are pretty set in their ways from a technical, from a tech stack perspective, and there's, you know, autonomy given to some areas of the business. But actually, being able to introduce a brand new language which is going to underpin our products of tomorrow, yeah. um, again, it's, it's really encouraging to hear um, and giving the, the people the time and the space to to go away and and bring that back to the business. You're obviously seeing benefits now of how that is far more uh, efficient and productive than, you know, some of the legacy technologies you're working with previously. Yeah. Um, I think that's another real key learning experience that other companies could have, you know. Um, yes, it's going to take a bit of time and you need kind of that, I guess, that sort of runway or, or bandwidth to be able to do that, but you're seeing benefits from that now, which will take you, you know, take you forward. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, I mean, whilst all that was going on, um, you know, obviously we still had, you know, the legacy applications to to support. So yeah. kind of 
it, it was it was staggered you know we had some people kind of maintaining whilst others were learning and then yeah. swap over and uh, yeah yeah but you know the excitement uh, were, was there all around um, yeah. and i think it's you, you're right in what you say you know a lot of companies will stick to a particular tech stack because they say well that's what we know that's what the team knows that's where all of their skills are so so let's use that but i think what what you've got to do as a team is kind of realize that you know there are benefits to be had um you know in going with something more modern or, or moving forward and whilst it sounds like almost a step back in, in a lot of cases because we have no skills here but we have all the skills there you know once you're at the same level you're going to be able to go much further um, yeah. So you have you have to find or you have to afford time for for development uh, yeah. because if you don't, yeah. you will be left in the dust. And I think that's that's one thing that's ingrained in all of us um, on, on yeah. my team is that you know we are looking to the future always. Like I say, you know, we look at what's it, what's in six months time, what's in twelve months time. Where do we stand? If we didn't move or pivot or change or do anything now, in six months' time, where would we be? In 12 months' time, where would we be? And it's those yeah. kind of thought processes that lead us to yeah. say, right, let's let's use a better language. Let's use a more modern language. Let's use a language that eventually, when we understand it as well as we understand these languages, we're going to be able to do more with it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, and that's what encourages that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it kind of, I guess, the whole kind of replatforming thing or introducing new languages which you know i guess you know we're seeing more and more of and we are seeing people move more towards these you know modern and you know scalable architectures which golang is is obviously we would fit into right. at, at what point when you're um deciding which way to go would, would you would you take these different languages into consideration? Is it when you you know you were exploring the ideas of sort of proprietary technology, what's going to help achieve that more quickly, or um, you know what does everyone want to be involved with more? You know, what, what, when do you sort of take those considerations into account? I, th I think it's probably a little bit of all of that, um, yeah. in, in the sense of um, you know, again, you know, in in our particular example, what we did was um, we went away um, and researched. The, you know the the issues that we had or, or the blockers that we had in using our current skill set okay like again you know one very small example was um you know multi-thread or concurrency and, and things like that um in traditional languages there were ways around it um but they were they were quite hacky they weren't you know they, they didn't feel right they, they didn't right. feel like that's what the language was meant to do um, okay. which it wasn't so that spurred us on to say okay well let's let's research languages that that are good for that uh, yeah. um, and obviously go being you know one of the top ones we we had some others as well um that were that we started looking at and we each went away um initially and actually played around with a different language each and fed back okay. and right. over uh, cool. and consensus was very quickly uh you know agreed on okay this is the language for us as a team yeah this is the one we're most excited about it's already pre-qualified because it meets all the criteria as did several yeah. languages but this is the one that got us most excited when using it um so that's yeah so, so that's now um, although i'm no expert in the sort of real benefits of uh many programming languages against one another but I understand that Go is initially from 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 Google itself. They're the creators of Go. Yeah. Um, would I be right in thinking that you know, as a sort of search engine optimization business, Go would lend itself well to that kind of uh, marketplace because it was created by a search engine company themselves? Or what are the benefits that you've seen that Go offers? against some of the competitors which you ruled out for example um yeah i mean i wouldn't say necessarily it just it just not happens to be yeah. uh, okay. on google if, if it hadn't been I, I think it would be just as good um, but i think from you know what really stood out uh, in that particular language for us was um having a very small vocabulary um you know in, in terms of the actual language itself uh, which is really really good it means you can yeah, after yeah, an initial learning curve, which can be quite steep with Go, um, okay. it is only very small though. Um, okay. And once you understand 
um, you know, the vocabulary or the syntax of, of the language, it, it's, it really is something you can just get on with. Um, and, you know, we, we tried others like Rust and things like that that have a much more diverse um, vocabulary and language and syntax in, in itself. Um, but anything we could produce in, in a more complex language like that, we were able to produce and nine times out of ten quicker. Um, okay. And I think that's, you know, I think when you can see results as quickly as possible, when starting a new language, if you can see results really quickly, that gets you excited. If you're yeah. working for, you know, weeks before you actually see any output, that could be really demotivated, especially if it doesn't work the first time. So. Yeah, no, I can see that. Um, so for any software engineer developers that are um, watching this and thinking about playing around with something new, upskilling to a new area, you, you recommend them having a look at Go and, and, uh, and seeing what they can come up with for that? Do you know what? I... I personally wouldn't recommend any language to any person um, okay. simply because a, a language, it just so happened that we all liked Go and Go is quite a likable language. But for every person, every person's individual and, and what kind of excites them is, is going to be different. There's going to be different aspects of a language or, or different aspects of, of any kind of technology that excite people or that they naturally feel in tune with. Um, I would say find, think about what you want to achieve. Think about what you ultimately want to do and what's going to be required within that scope. And yep. then find all of the languages or all of the technology that, that fits, that, that fulfills that criteria. Right, okay. Play with all of them and go yep. for the one that you enjoy the most. Because if you enjoy it, you're going to do the best work in it. So it's... Love it. Makes sense. Love it. And in terms of when you guys went away to uh, to play around with it and figure it out, could you point people in a direction of you know resources for them to do the same, or what? Um, uh, I guess kind of repositories or yeah places of information can people go and find out about new languages and how they can potentially upskill and uh, and try their hand at those. Yeah, I think the. Um... One of the first things we did, so like from, from my point of view, what one thing that I did um, is always find, uh, again, this is just a personal way of discovery, um, but for me, URL shorteners uh, software is a very simple program. Um, every developer um, w would know how to build a URL shortener. So it's a really good example, um, and it's normally an example that everybody has created in every language at some point. So for me, I would jump into GitHub or something like that. And okay, I've narrowed down my languages that fulfill my criteria. I'm gonna have a look at a URL shortener written in Go. I'm gonna look at a URL shortener written in Rust or, and so on and so on and so on. And kind of bring those back and just analyze those languages. And I find that's a really good way of discovering what packages are, are imported to, you know, within that, um, within that language to achieve yep. the result and things like that. And again, you know, aside from that actual structure and what that looks like, you also then want to kind of look at what the what's the community like, especially if you learn a new language. Um, you need yeah. to kind of understand how helpful are the community. Do they have, you know, is there a disc, an active Discord channel? Do they have a good Reddit presence? You know, there's so lots of developers on Reddit talking about it. In You know, and all of these kind of social media uh, yeah. kind of outlets, you know, is, is there a lot of buzz going on? Is there people there, basically, if you get stuck that can lend a hand or, or give you some advice? Because there are some really good languages out there that have very small communities. And so right. as, a, a, as a developer trying to learn, you'll find it comes up pretty quickly. Yeah. So, um, and documentation, obviously. <laughs> good documentation. So, yeah. Really good advice that. I think in terms of, yeah, Picking somewhere where, there, where there's an engaged community that you can call upon a bit of resource help and yeah, Absolutely. sort of engagement from other engineers that are have been there, done it, or are going through the same process as yourself. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah a bit of community, which is, which is good to hear. Absolutely. Um, great. Well, we we touched on some really interesting points there, and you know, from sort of culture and sort of replatforming or, or new product development, and and you know how to go about picking technology stacks and a language to use for those. Mm -hmm. um, which I was really pleased we delved into. Um, so I guess in terms of kind of wrapping things up and something I'm going to be asking 
everyone I speak to, um, just for their own opinion, really. Um, what advice would you give um, to somebody that's, you know, an aspiring CTO that might be starting off as a sort of a developer or is in a senior developer role already? Mm-hmm. You know, what advice would you give your, your younger self in terms of how to move into or what to be aware of if you're becoming a sort of technology leader or a CTO? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I like the way you put it, actually, in the sense of what, what advice would I give to my younger self? Um, <laughs> because that, that actually really helps me answer that question. I think the one thing is if you're looking or wanting to become a CTO or a technology leader or, 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 or somebody with, you know, with that kind of um, position, a lot of people approach it, especially without experience, approach those kind of positions of, I need to be the best um, in this field. I need to be top of my game. I need to know more than everybody else. Um, yeah. in order to warrant holding this position. And that's just simply not true. Um, only after years of holding those positions, you realize you are as good as your team. Um, you have to you have to admit to yourself that you don't know all the answers. The skill that you have to have is the ability to find the answers and find the answers within your team or find the answers elsewhere and help your team find the answers for themselves. Um, it's it's basically you're more of a a shepherd than a, a leader as such. Um, you've got to kind of really play on the strengths of your team and, and understand every member of your team. Um, you have to admit when you're wrong, um, yeah. and that's that's one that I see CTOs not doing quite a lot. If they if they're wrong, it's it's always something else. You know, there's always an external factor which uh, meant that they didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve. Sometimes yeah. um, CTOs get things wrong uh, yeah. or will, you know, probably lead people down a path that doesn't work out. And to be able to hold your hands up and say, look, yeah, you know, yeah. I messed up on that one. Uh, yeah. Anybody else got a different direction we can go down? Yeah. That's, it's, a, it's a really good, you know, really key strength that I think the, the humility and the, the human side um, you really need. Um, spotting potential um, is trickier, but more of a key skill than being able to read somebody's CV and say, yep, yeah, they've got you know great experience. You know, spot yeah. potential, really have a look for those who, who aren't just doing this for a job, but doing this because they want to do it. Um, and kind of don't focus so much on skill um, because whilst you know for, on a day one basis they might not be as productive they will be your most productive team member you know six months down the line yeah. again it's having that vision that foresight um it, it's looking ahead don't look at now because as a cto or, or as a tech leader you you will not you know your team are look are looking at the now that's what your team are doing you're looking down the road you're looking at where your team are going so yeah yeah Absolutely, excellent piece of advice there and I think um, yeah the kind of hiring on on potential and character and values that we mentioned earlier um, vitally important to kind of creating that sustainable high performing team you know retaining that high performing team and and coming up with some like like you guys have some cracking products so yeah um, yeah excellent advice and I guess if there's anything that you know Kirk and I have spoke about today but you know, you're interested in hearing more about. Um, after we've posted this video, feel free to reach out to either of us directly, comment on um, on the thread um, and you know, let us know some of the feedback or um, anything else that you'd like to hear about from, from either of us. You know, more than happy to, to answer those questions. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think there's plenty of us to go away with and, and take on board there and, um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to, to put that out there to our community and, and see what they've got to, to say about it. Okay, thanks very much for your time. Excellent. No worries at all. No worries at all. And like, like I say, yeah, I just reiterate, if there are any questions, if people want to know any more, um, yeah, yeah, feel free. Fire away. Excellent. And I guess, we, you know, although we've covered, you know, everything as a sort of relatively light touch today, um, it may well be that certainly around some of the, the topics we've covered, we might want to go into a bit more detail with. So, 
yeah, keep an eye out for some some, some further conversations. And uh, like I said, get in touch with any questions and uh, sure. interested to hear what you think. Yeah, no problems at all. No problems at all. Thank you, It's lovely speaking to you. You too. Cheers, Kirk. Take care.